if you missed this morning, we were talking about backward steps and how your backward steps are actually God setting you up. It's not a setback. We talked about backward, talks about potential energy. That when you go back, you're increasing your potential energy. But in the same way that an arrow is launched from a bow, as we saw so brilliantly this morning with Pastor Mark and Andy Belton doing so, there's a moment where potential energy meets with kinetic energy. And we learned that Joseph in the Bible, he went from the prison to the palace in one day. And people say, well, that's impossible. Well, science proves it's true. Potential energy increases to the moment of kinetic energy, and things can change in a moment. Things can change in a day. Tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about missed opportunities or lost opportunities. I guess you're like me in that you have things that you look back on and say that was a missed opportunity. Opportunity. Let me see your hands if you've ever missed an opportunity. Most of us, some of us have kind of gone, that is a lost opportunity. The mistake we make is this, is that thinking that missed opportunities are the same as lost opportunities. And what I want you to see tonight is that there is a big difference between a missed opportunity and a lost opportunity. Because while you have breath in your lungs, that missed opportunity is still not a lost opportunity. God has got unique, creative, crafty ways of bringing things back into your life, especially when it lines up with your divine purpose. Sophie and I, when we got married, we, we went to South America and we had a two-month honeymoon in Chile. This was pretty amazing. Because when we got married, we had no money. We just finished three years of college, and we ended up, we, we got married. It was a beautiful thing, not ended up, but we did get married, and we dated for seven months, and then we were engaged for seven months, and then we got married. Why hang around? Some of you fellas have been dating that girl of yours for years. You know, you got to put a ring on it. That's what you got to do, as the song goes. And so we got married. We went to South America. Now, as far as I was aware, I wasn't marrying into money. Sophie wasn't marrying into money. We were just two people. God put us together with a unique call. The call was to plant churches, to be pastors, to move to England. That's what we did know. We knew that, and we knew we loved each other. So we moved to England, and we, for the first two, three months, lived in the back, bedrooms of, back bedroom of somebody's house. And then we ended up renting a house for a year and there's some crazy stories that go along with that, especially with a cat that we had to look after. But it's a whole other thing for a whole other time. And, and we ended up at that point of going, you know, we need to buy a house. And we kind of realized, okay, we need to save up this amount of money in order to get a deposit to buy a house. I think I told you two weeks ago, our first house was a semi-detached with an extension in Sheffield. It cost us 29,995 pounds. Now you can't buy a shed for that amount of money, unless, of course, you live... Uh, Anyway, and, uh, and so we, we kind of thought, okay, we're going to have to spend some time saving some money for a deposit. And so we said, that's okay, I've got money. And I said, yeah, what do you mean you've got money? Since when, what have you been doing that you've got money that I don't know about the fact that you've got money? Uh, I've seen the bank account, I know what comes in. Uh, we've got the same bank account, so where is the money that you've got that I don't know that you got? And how did you get this money and what's going on? She says, Glenn, a few years ago, I think it was an inheritance of some type that you received, Sophie. And it was a sum of $3,000 or thereabouts. Uh, you know, uh, the odd dollar here or two may be a little bit wrong. And so her, her, her brother, my brother-in-law, decided that rather than spend that money, he would take Sophie's money and his money, $6,000 in total, it's about 42 quid, take that, put it together, and invest it. And little did I know at this time that my wife's brother took Sophie's $3,000 worth of inheritance and invested it, but not into the normal things that you and I may invest in, like property, stock, shares, all those sorts of things. No, 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 no. Sophie's brother, my brother-in-law, George, bought an ostrich. <laughs> A little one. 3,000 quid on a tiny little duck, an ostrich. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen an ostrich. Ostriches are mahusive. 
they are massive. A few years ago, some of us were in Cape Town, went to Cape Point, and I hired a Harley for a day, and my mate was riding a fire blade, a sports bike. I was on a Harley, and, and we went down to a place called Cape Point, and I'm just looking out at this view, and it was amazing. Next thing I know, something hits me on the helmet. I'm thinking, what is that? I turn around, and there next to me is a fully grown ostrich. It stood next to me at Cape Point, and it's pecking my helmet. Now, when an ostrich is that big, it's cute, it's cuddly, it's kind of ugly, but there it is. But an ostrich fully grown. So I throttled back on the Harley, tried to scare the thing, it just flapped its wings at me. I looked at it, pecked me in the front of the beak. So I started to get a little bit scared and intimidated by this overgrown chicken. So I thought, that's it, that's enough of the view, I'm going to go for a little bit of a ride. So I started to accelerate, and I saw in my mirror this fully grown chicken starting to chase me. I am a grown man on a Harley Davidson, and I am starting to get scared. I'm sure I weed in my leather trousers. I was so scared about this ostrich. So when she said, we have bought an ostrich, I'm like, who on earth buys an ostrich? She said, well, let me see what my $3,000 chicken's worth now. So her and her brother have a conversation, and the conversation pretty much goes like this. Uh, George gets back in touch with us and says, hey, listen, uh, you know, the, the chicken's no longer, you know, little, $3,000. It's, it's, it's grown a bit. It's worth more money. And, and so Sophie says to George, well, how much is that, you know, the overgrown chicken, the ostrich worth now? And he says, it's worth $12,000. I'm like, who on earth? has a farm with chickens that are worth $12,000 each. I looked at her, she looked at me. We said, let's sell it, good idea. We sold the chicken, had enough money to put down a deposit on our first house in Sheffield. And for the next seven years, I used to come up to our house going, ha ha, a chicken bought this house. <laughs> a chicken made it possible. But yeah, something, a year or two after we sold the ostrich, everybody got on board with the whole ostrich thing. Everything got flooded. Let me give you an investment tip. If you're looking to invest, don't wait until something comes out in the paper. Because once you've read it in the paper, it's already too late. You need to come back towards the beginning. We sold the chicken just before the chicken crash. You've heard of the economic crisis of 2008. There was an ostrich crisis in 1996. And just before the ostrich crisis of 1996, we sold our ostrich and bought a house because of a big overgrown chicken. I love that. Every time we began to tell that story, there were people who were going, man, I should have invested in ostriches. I wish I'd bought an ostrich. I wish I'd done that. I should have bought a llama when llamas were running cheap. You know, and all these sorts of things. There's so many people would speak to us about missed opportunities. How many of you here bought an ostrich? Let me see your hand. No one. You missed out. <laughs> nah, 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 nah. Missed opportunities opportunity. Every single one of us have missed an opportunity, but I want to tell you, if it's missed, it's still not lost while you've got breath in your lungs. I wish we had time tonight to speak about the life of Jonah, the whole life of Jonah. We haven't got time, but turn in your Bibles to page, you know, 1024 and Jonah's around there. Read the whole story of Jonah. It's going to take you 10 minutes. Much better than watching a late night movie. You know, don't go and watch Shades of Grey at the cinema. Don't do that. What, read about Jonah instead. You know, read about that. And you're going to find Jonah's life is inspiring. It starts off in Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, and it says this, The word of the Lord came to Jonah. What a great place to start a story. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. Now listen, whenever we read about the word of the Lord coming into a situation, you got to know something, God is up to something. And part of the reason why we don't embrace and step into God opportunity is because many of us have our ears and our spirit closed to what God would want to say. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. The word of the Lord, it's a creative force, it's a dynamic force. Sir Peter Vardy told us this morning, and I interviewed him over lunch. I said, Sir Peter, you spoke to us about selling your business in 2006, just two years before the economic crisis. I said, tell me, what happened? Why did you sell it? And he said this, God spoke to me. My next question is this, 
The company that bought it from you, how much did they lose in the crash of 2008? And he said there's a minimum of 200 million pounds. I love the fact that there was this businessman, entrepreneur, innovator who's going to come and speak to our kingdom business people in a few months' time. I love the fact that he was there and the word of the Lord came to him and it illuminated something for him. So, I don't know if God called him Sir Peter, but let's pretend he did. God says, Sir Peter, sell now. He didn't go for the easiest, the best offer, uh, the, 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 the quickest offer. He, he went back and said, no, you're going to have to offer me more. You're going to have to offer me more. You're going to have to offer me more. And he made an absolute killing in this business. And I love the fact that he's now this philanthropist who goes around. He, he, his goal for, for children. I mean, it's an amazing story, but the key is this, the word of the Lord came. Now listen, the Bible says that the word of God is like a lamp unto our feet. You notice every horror movie happens in the dark? Like, I don't know, I'm not a horror movie watcher. I don't like to do that. You know, there's enough horror just on the news without making yourself sit through two hours of it, you know, and go like this. But you know, as every horror scene happens in the dark. It's usually a storm, usually thunder and lightning, and usually it's a lady in some form of night attire going to have a look. You know, you think, what are you doing? It's dark. I'm right, aren't I? It's dark. Things are horrible when it's dark. Listen, you won't go to heaven by reading the Bible, but you can bring heaven to earth by reading the Bible. Do you know when you read the Bible, literally what God does is he illuminates things. If you're kind of stuck, ladies, thinking, should I marry this guy or not? Read the book. What does the book say about a man of God? You may find, ladies, that God will say to you, no, run away, he's a Muppet. Or... You may find God going, hey, this is good. Move that way. But I, I've got news for you. Horror always happens in the dark. Horror always happens with scary music. Have you noticed that? Hello? It's always scary music. My dad once said to me, he said, Glenn, let's watch a horror flick. I'm like, Dad, since when do we ever watch horror movies? He goes, yeah, I've got an idea. Let's put some Disney music with it. I'm not kidding. We lit it was the best comedy I've ever seen in my life. It's amazing how the Disney songs lined up with this horrible moment where a guy comes in with a knife and usually if the music's scary, you'd be like, ah! But with, you know, with Donald Duck singing in the background or something, it was quite comedic. Thought I'd show you a scene from a horror clip. A horror, I don't know if this one's a, a horror horror, but you've all seen Jaws, haven't you? Anyone seen Jaws? Dun -dun. Well, let's change the music, shall we? Let's see what happens when you watch that scene with the music. Here we go. It kind of loses the impact slightly, don't you think? Have an Afro circus playing in the background from, what, what's the movie, Madagascar, is it? Okay, probably one of the scariest movies of all time has to be The Shining, I think. You've all seen this scene, but you haven't quite seen it like this. Have a look. It's a little bit different, isn't it? You know what happens? When you change the music to your life, things are different. You can walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Psalm 23, and you're okay because where most people would say, this is horror. If you've got the song of heaven, the Bible says this. The Bible says God has put a new song in your mouth. So you imagine now walking through the valley of the shadow of death and you're da 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 It just changes things. Music changes things. Johnny, is your wife Miriam here? She's praying. She's pr in the prayer team. Oh, Haley, come, come, Haley. Would you, would you walk down the back? Uh, just stand at the back of the aisle. We're going to marry you to your husband again. And Ads, would you just stand up? Come and stand where Michelle is right there. That that would be fantastic. That that's great. And uh, we need a father of the bride. So, um, so Malcolm, would you go be father of the bride for us here right now? That that'd be amazing. And uh, who married you guys? Was it me? It was me, wasn't it? It was a great wedding. I remember. It's perfect. It was awesome. Malcolm, that's it, other side, well done. Okay. Now, 
When people get married, they usually select an appropriate song. Am I right? You do. So this is one of the most famous, I guess, wedding songs of, of all time. People use this as the music starts. Haley, would you just do a nice walk down the aisle to, to meet your, your new groom-to-be? Have a listen to this. Did any ladies here get married to this song? You walk down the aisle to this song? Okay, stop, stop, stop. That's cool. We could also, we could also up the tempo on it, you know, and, and have a little bit more fun, you know. And uh, so here's, here's another one that you could potentially use if you're a little bit quirky, but, but I reckon this put a smile on people's faces and get people ready for, a, you know, a, a great wedding. This would be fantastic. Let's, let's just walk, just hear the music. Sparky's happy. When I wake up... Well, I know I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the man who wakes up next to you. Yeah, stop! When I go out Adam, come stand in here for me, and, and Haley, just stay there. We're, we're gonna change the music one more time. Now, I want you to notice, the destination's exactly the same, and the journey's exactly the same, but we're just gonna change the music. It's the same walk, the same father, the same bride, the same uh, groom, but all we're doing is changing the music. Song number three. Thank you. you but as the officiator is that the term of this wedding I actually now don't want to take this wedding I'm happy for everything I do and I, I would walk I'm happy for that but the death march is something I don't want to do guys you can grab a seat here's what I want you to see in the power of these words here the Bible says the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the Word of God. And listen, when you hear, when you listen to the Word of God, amazing things happen. It illuminates your path and it changes the music with which you live your life by. For the person who's always negative, who's always pessimistic, who's always down, listen, I want to tell you, that person needs to change the song on the iPod of their mind. Because when you read the book, amazing things begin to happen. The word of the Lord came. It goes on. We get to verse 2. And in verse 2, it says this, go to Nineveh and preach. Now, this is amazing. What an opportunity. What a privilege. The potential of God to change a whole city. And God gives this opportunity to a man called Jonah, a man who we'd never heard of before until this. He says, go to Nineveh and preach. What an Go to Nineveh and preach. Wow, what an honor for Jonah. And having the honor of leading the church in communion, and I said this, I said, and Jesus was standing on the cross. No, 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 he was lying on the cross. No, he was sitting on the cross. And I, for the life of me, could not remember what Jesus was doing on the cross. I turned to the pastor who was sitting on the stage, sitting in a big chair. I said, what was he doing on the cross? He was, yeah, he was hanging on the cross. And then I had the opportunity to preach, and what an honor. And I'll never forget back in 1997, preaching in Birmingham, England, Birmingham. And I remember doing a leader's breakfast, and it was the first time I'd ever taken preaching resources with me. In other words, tapes, hello, Tapes of me preaching. And I remember doing this breakfast for leaders, about 40 or 50 leaders in a cafe, and then standing there bemused as people went to the tape area to buy copies of my tapes. And I'm like, what are you doing? You bunch of Muppets. What, why do you want to buy these tapes? But I remember the overall sense of privilege and honor responsibility. Church, listen, never let it be lost on you. The incredible privilege and honor and responsibility that God has given you with your divine potential to be a business person, to help people get fit, to help people get healthy, 
to teach, to inspire, to motivate, whatever that may be. And we have this moment here, the Bible says, go to Nineveh and preach. And what I really love about Jonah is that his life starts with a missionary call. The call, not for himself, but for others. Let me tell you how God works. If you don't know what God's call for you is, I'll tell you what it looks like. God's call for you will rarely look like you. It will always look like your life blessing someone else's. The missionary call is the call to go, to give, to forgive, to be generous, to be kind, to be loving. It's never about you. It's always about how you can contribute to someone else. It's all about how you can make a difference in somebody else's life in the same way that Jesus could have been content to stay on the throne in heaven and say to the Father, Father, let's just do away with this planet and start again. And God could have done that, but the gospel is all about you and I getting off our ivory thrones to come and make a difference in someone else's life. You'll know if it's God, if it's not about you, but about what you can do to change somebody else. He said, go to Nineveh and preach. We we read on in verse three. This is the uh uh-oh moment. It says this, but Jonah ran away. God inspired, God opened a door, God brought a moment of privilege, but Jonah ran away. Everyone say, "Uh uh-oh. We've all had that moment, the moment of opportunity, but we ran away. The moment of opportunity, but we were scared. And in this moment, the opportunity was an opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ. We've all had that moment. Being in Asda, pushing the trolley. You had a thought that burned hot. So let's go and talk to that person over there. And you're like, you go and talk to that person over there. Or the opportunity to forgive, which is always a God moment. None of us ever want to forgive. Forgiveness is not easy. The longer you're alive, the harder it is to forgive. Forgiveness. God says, forgive. And you're like, not a chance in the world. And every time somebody offends you, you have a divine opportunity to do something godly. But you know what a lot of us do? We run away. We have opportunity with jobs, with investment, with all these sorts of things. It says here, but Jonah ran away. Verse four says this, then the Lord then the Lord. You see, God's got a way of responding when we respond. No matter how you respond, God, listen to me, will always respond. Let me make a statement to you. God is never, ever silent. He never is. There are people who say, you know what, I just don't hear God. God doesn't speak to me. I want to tell you something, church, that is not true. God is never, ever silent. It's not like he's a moody spouse. Do you know those moments, ladies, fellas, where you offend the other one, the other one says, that's it, talk to the hand, I'm not going to speak to you, and for another six months, that's it, walk away. You know, you go to bed, and even though the Bible says, you know, don't go to sleep in your anger, you know, you do sometimes. You wake up in the morning ticked. I remember once my wife and I went to bed and things were good between us. You know, it had been for weeks, no arguments, anything like that. We woke up in the morning. I woke up, I looked at Sophie and said, morning, Sophie. She looked at me and she punched me on the arm. I said, what was that for? She said, I dreamt we had an argument and I'm still mad. (laughs) I've got no chance, do I? Psychotic wife punching me because of a dream she had. It's just something wrong with that. You go for counseling. I still need Jesus. It's true. It still hurts. I've got a scar right here to prove it to you. God's not angry in the corner. So I'm not going to talk to you. Listen, He is talking. You got 1,400 pages here of God talking. Ladies, if you're ticked off with your husband because he's run out of words because he's used them all up in the workplace and you're so ticked, listen, God is ready to talk to you. You find the time to sit with the book, read the book. Something happens when you read the book. You find then God, 
then God said. Then God responded. You're going to find God's always got something to say about what you're walking through. And more than you need the advice of your life group leader or your regional pastor or your associate pastor, uh, more than you need any of that, what you need is found in the book. <laughs> then the Lord. I love this because Jonah blew his opportunity. But God had a higher purpose in mind. And church, I want to tell you something. You may have blown an opportunity. And you may have gone, if only, if I could rewind the time. But church, God has a higher purpose in mind right now. And I'm going to show you what happens. When we fast forward, we get to chapter 3, verse 3. It says, then Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord. Historians of the day say about Nineveh, it was an important city. A worthwhile visit needed at least three days. You ever been to a city like that? You're gone, you've gone in for a day, gone out. You say, you know, I'm going to check out London for a day. How many of you know you need more than a day in London? You need to go. You can go to the British Museum. Say, yeah, I'm just going to go for the afternoon. But then you come out of the British Museum and go, man, I, I need more time in the British Museum. That's an amazing place. Or you go to the Le Louvre. You know, it's an amazing place. And, 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 and you go and you see it, it takes more. This was exactly what Nineveh was like. It was such an important city. And the Bible says Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord. He, he actually said, okay, God, I've missed the opportunity. I messed the opportunity. But thanks for bringing it around again. I'm going to embrace the opportunity. And verse 10 says this. When God saw that the people had turned from their evil, he had compassion. Let me show you what happens with missed opportunity. And we're done. Can we put the map up on the screen? Thanks, folks. The media team backstage working hard. Look at this. Here we are. We're going from Manchester down to the West End of London. We're going to go see the greatest musical of all time, Les Miserables. And we're going to go, and there's a group of us going together, and we're going to go on the minibus, and we've made the mistake of getting Pastor Mark Foster to drive. Because Pastor Mark gets lost driving from here to his house every Sunday. So we get in the minibus with Mark, one of the two minibuses that we've just bought for church. It'll be arriving soon that we're going to use for eight teams and youth and kids and Sunday pickups, Sunday drop-offs. And we get in and, and Foz and, and Stu sitting in the front. You know, Stu's the control freak trying to take control. And, and Foz said, no, man, I, I've got it. You know, he's the creative type. I've got it. I've got it. In other words, he's blabbing. That. He's, he's, he's kind of, he's not blabbing. He's kind of, he's winging it. He's blagging it. That's it. He's blagging. Yeah, hey, I know exactly where I'm going. Well, he's absolutely got no idea. He just knows he needs to go that way. He knows where we're going, but doesn't know how to get this guy here. This he's saying, "Man, we need to do this." And and so so he said, "No, no, no. This is what we're going to do. We're going to go out the M602, all the way out to the M6. Then we're going to go down the M6. We're going to go past, you know, through the M6 car park, which is basically just south of Manchester, down through to Stoke on Trent, the car park. You know, it's meant to be a motorway, but it never is. It just you just stood there the whole time. You know what I mean? You're going to get down there, and then you're going to get you can get to the M6. You've got two ways on the M6 that you can go down there. You can go toll road, or you know, you know, but but if, but if you're tight fisted, you don't want to pay the two pound fifty to actually go quicker. You can go the other way, and then you can get snail, and you can go around. Then you can get across. You can actually drive all the way across the M1, drop down the M1, down to the M25. You can do the M40. You can do all these sorts of things. There's all sorts of ways that you can go. Or maybe, maybe if Stuart was driving, Stuart said, hey, uh, we're going to go the scenic way. We're going to go Snake Pass. We're going to go through to Sheffield. We're going to take the country lanes. Uh, Pastor Mark halfway will probably be ill because he, he always gets travel sickness. He has to wear these patches that go behind his ear. He's really embarrassing to fly with because he gets these travel sickness patches and they stick there like that. It's the biggest thing you've ever seen in your life. Uh, you know, bigger than noise cancelling headphones. And we, we get through to the A1. And then we've got to drop down, you know, the A1 all the way down. It gets down there somewhere and you kind of get in. There are so many different ways to go. Here's what I want you to see. It's the same destination, but the route's different. I discovered this in my car. If I get lost, I can do an amazing thing. It's called a U-turn. It's an amazing thing. We had partners here on Wednesday night. We, we filled this place. We had, we, had, we had in excess of 40 big, massive tables. We had a partner's bank. We had an amazing night. But I don't know what happened there. Manchester came to a, a standstill. And, and, and man, I, I, I know at least about 15 different ways that I can get from my house to here. If, if United are playing, I know when to leave. I know what roads to take, what roads not to take. You know, it all happens because it, the destination's the same, but the route's going to be different. It's an amazing thing. If I'm lost... I've learned an amazing thing. My wife has drummed it into me by beating me. That you can stop and ask for directions. I know. You wonder if I'm still a man. <laughs> it's 
Some of you have missed opportunities. Man, it's done. Lost it. But here's a lesson I want you to learn tonight. If God wants you there, he can get you there. And it may not be the route that you thought it would be. And the journey may not even look like you thought it would look like, though you had no real idea what it looked like. If God wants you there, he can get you there. Because God is this creative God. He says to you, what do you want to do? Do you want to go left or right? Abraham said to Lot, if you go left, I'll go right. If you go right, I'll go left. I don't care which way I go because I know God's with me. That's what we've got to understand. God is so gracious. God is so good that even if we missed it and we messed it up, the plans and purposes of God, they will not, King James says, be thwarted. In other words, no man, no woman, no power, no demon, no devil can stop the plans of God coming to pass in your life. If you are prepared to be honest and say, Lord, I missed it. Or Lord, I messed it up. But God, here I am right now and my, o- my eyes are open to see what you want me to see. My prayer tonight is you come out of this realizing if God wants you there, he'll get you there. My prayer is this, you'll come out of this place with a new, renewed passion for the book. May God illuminate. Change the song of my heart. And you're gonna find that the word of God will come to you again. And you'll find in opportunity, God will say, now. And you're going to step from where you are into a new season, into a new day. Because God is faithful.